We have been listening to Jesus lay out in his greatest sermon what a disciple of Jesus looks like. And if you go look back over the last two chapters, we would see that this disciple that Jesus is describing is someone who is a, a peacemaking, active follower. Someone transformed by being in the footsteps of Jesus. Someone who is seen by the world as being different and being changed. Someone that not only doesn't murder and doesn't cheat, but aspires to the, the higher standards. Who, who would not even disparage another. Who wouldn't even dream of being less than a completely having complete fidelity to family. Someone whose word can always be trusted. You'd never need anything more than a handshake. Right? Disciples are those people that Jesus describes, people who have learned to stand up for themselves without hurting others in the process, learning to, to turn the other cheek. Followers that give generously, that have learned how to pray, who have learned how to fast, to get so caught up in the good work of following Jesus that sometimes they forget to eat because what's in front of them is so important and so to so satisfying. In short, we're talking about people that are, are just do not worry about the future because they know like the lilies of the field and the, sky, the birds of the sky that they are lit people of the kingdom of God that God will provide and so that they can go out into the world to be good news for others. Removing splinters out of others' eyes because they have taken the logs out of their own. Can you imagine someone who'd fit that description? Right. Can you imagine someone like that? Can I have a moment of honesty here and admit that uh, I'm not there? And I wonder sometimes why following Jesus hasn't made that as much of an impact as I, as I dreamed it would. Can we, can we be honest and admit that there are times we look around and say, you know what, for someone who follows Jesus, that person doesn't seem all that different. Right? There are times we look around and we think, man, you'd think someone would have changed just a bit more having followed a Savior. And I know that there are moments like that. I've been following Jesus for about 15 years now. And when I face plant, and I do, uh, again, I think to myself sometimes, I've been at this for 15 years. You'd think I'd be better than this by now. And I'm not. I wonder about this. We get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus has been describing this, this disciple, this, this model disciple, someone who follows him, what someone who follows him looks like. And... Um, we get to this point where we can either start asking, is Jesus asking too much? Or is there something about how we follow that needs to be addressed? I think it is the latter, that there's something about how we follow that we need to address. And I think it's what Jesus gets into right here. Jesus starts talking about what he sees lacking. What he sees lacking. He sees a lack of faith and a lack of discipline. When he, talks about, uh, when he talks about knocking on doors and those who seek are, will find, that, that's an issue of faith. And when he's talking about taking the narrow path, that's an issue of discipline. And so we're going to look at those two things today. Why aren't people's lives more uh, changed, more dramatically shifted due to following Jesus? Uh, it is not because Jesus is asking too much. It's because of a lack of faith and a lack of discipline. That's what Jesus lays out here. Looking at faith First, faith is trusting that a Heavenly Father has created a good world who is active in it and that we are following His Son towards salvation. This faith, it's not transactional. We don't take three quarters, go up to a divine vending machine, pop those in, hit D3, and out pops a, a miraculous healing. That's not what faith is. It's not transactional, it's relational. It is knowing and being in a relationship with a loving God who's involved in our lives. And faith is something then that Jesus praises whenever he sees it, because he does not see it as often as he would have hoped. When a, a centurion comes to him, a non-Jewish military leader, and says to him, I, I would like you to heal my servant, the cent he, Jesus goes to, to get up and go with him, and the centurion says, you don't have to come with me. If you say it, it will be done. And Jesus says, I truly I tell you, no one in, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. Go, let it be done for you according to your faith. That's a, oft, a constant refrain Jesus has. When someone asks to be healed, that's what Jesus often says. Let it be done unto you according to your faith. Right? The centurion knocked, the door was opened, he had faith, the healing was there, and it was. This is the faith that Jesus models for us when he goes to Lazarus, right? He finds out that Lazarus is sick, 
And he doesn't run off fearfully trying to get there as soon as he can. He, he finished what he's, where, where he's at. Takes two days to do that. And then he tells his disciples, we're going to go see Lazarus now. And they, they're afraid. They're telling him, you know, if we go see Lazarus, not only is he dead, they'll kill us too. We're going near Jerusalem, and that's where people are out to get you. And the disciples are afraid. And Thomas says, let's go with him. For if we go with him, we will die with him. Which might sound a little bit bold, but to me it sounds far more cynical. You know, we're probably going to die following this wing nut. We might as well go die with him right now. It's kind of depressing and cynical. And uh, Jesus responds to this and says, no, we walk in the light. We walk by faith. We walk seeing that God is working for us and with us. We do not walk in the darkness. And so Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus, having faith that God is acting. And if you listen to what he prays, he does not pray saying, God, I, I pray that you would act here. He says, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have. He does not call to Lazarus and say, get up, implying come back to life. He says, come out, because he's already up. It's just a matter of getting him out and, and come, come on out. God the Father has already been acting. This is faith, believing that God is already involved and in seeing it and naming it, knocking on the door and receiving it. Those who ask receive, those who search will find, for those who knock the door will be opened. As Jesus says, which father when asked for a, 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 a piece of bread will give a stone, or if asked for a fish will give a... Did I get that wrong? Which father gives their snake when asked for a fish? Which father gives a stone when asked for bread? Right? We don't do that. And our Heavenly Father gives what we need. If we are knocking, we will receive what we need. Which is not always what we want. Right? I, I remember the first time I, I realized how, how our, our, a father will give us what we need and not what we want. I was uh, opening presents. I was about 14. I was opening presents at the Christmas tree, and I got to this nice heavy one about like yay, and I started to open it up, very excited, heavy. Heavy means nice and expensive, right? I opened it up, and I found a uh, gray toolbox, right? 14-year-old, give a 14-year-old a gray toolbox, you know what he says? Thanks. Right? And this began, this began what I, I refer to as the giving of the tools. And, and every year since then, I have been given tools. At some point, my dad always wraps them as confusingly as possible. You, you'd be amazed how, what you can do with a bullet level to wrap that. I had no clue. And uh, it's not what I wanted. It's what I needed. And now I have uh, every tool I could ever need. I think we're about done with the giving of tools. I have two laser levels, and uh, I think we, we've hit the point where, okay, okay, Dad, we're done. <laughs> but uh, God the Father asks, offers us what we need, not necessarily is what we want, but he offers us the kingdom of God, salvation and healing, hope, future, and a purpose. That's what we need. It is this attitude of giving, this attitude of faith that we will have enough that God does provide that undergirds what Jesus says next. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In this context of giving, this, we often take this little saying, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, put it on poster board, put it up in a school classroom, and there it is by itself. And I think that robs it of some of its meaning. It is set right here in the context of saying that by faith you know that God will provide. And so if God is providing everything you need, go do unto others in that same way. You're spreading the kingdom of God, and then they will do back unto you. And you are building and spreading God's good news. You are evangelizing. You are being good news to others. We go out, and, and this is how we fulfill the law and the prophets, it says. This is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. It's not that we ditch the law and the prophets, for they tell us how to love our neighbor, how to do unto others. There's the guidance there, but we go out and we do unto others, and that is how we continue to give in the way that God has given to us, the, the faith that we use to receive what God has provided. And so to paraphrase Jesus, it will be done to us according to our faith. And it is our faith that tells us that God is active. God does what is best for us, offers us what, is, us what we need. And in so walking uh, in faith, we will receive. So faith, that's the one side of what Jesus names as, as being lacking, as what is needed uh, for us to, to follow and to be, to, to be the disciple he describes. The problem with faith alone, though is that faith alone can begin to be a little bit sedentary, right? Faith alone can, can sound like, you know, I'm just going to sit here and knock on the door and not do anything else until someone fixes all my problems for me. I'm just going to keep on knocking, right? That Faith has to be joined with something else. The flip side of the coin 
is discipline. Right? That's what Jesus talks about next. Faith alone is a cop-out. Faith has to be joined to discipline. This is how he puts it. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. The gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. If faith is the stance of expectation, the belief and practice of trusting God, discipline is our response. It's taking the narrow path, following in the footsteps of Jesus. And this narrow path requires intention and purpose and a real sense of direction. And there have been times when the church has naturally tended towards a, a high bar for discipline. There are times when the church has been very, very disciplined. It, and it's usually when there has been lots of pressure from the surrounding culture. If you go back to the first centuries, first century or two, if you were going to be a Christian when the Rome was persecuting you, that took discipline. Because if you're going to go to worship on Sunday, you know what you had to do? Work the rest of the day. The, the whole Sunday as Sabbath had not been invented yet, and Rome did not honor that. And so if you were going to, to go to worship, you got up early, you went to someone's house, you worshipped, and then you did the work day. Because Sunday was just another work day. Right? And so the, the discipline needed to do that. What well, was impressive, but that's what you had to do if you were to follow Jesus. In the Middle Ages, when the Black Death struck, that was another time of great pressure upon the church, and, and people stepped forward to love their neighbors who were dying, to be there so that no one would be alone. That, that pressure formed a, a people of great discipline who were deeply committed to serving their neighbors. To resist apartheid in South Africa, the way that uh, the civil rights movement galvanized the black church in America. When the going gets tough for Christians, Christians buckle down in, dis in discipline, in discipleship. They, they hold on to their Bibles because they need to hold on to some truth. They get down on their knees and pray because they need to reach out to a power greater than themselves when facing persecution. They go out to serve not because everyone else will praise them for it, but because that is what Christ did and, and that is what sustains them, is to be Christ-like. Right? That's what happens. These are the type of... When there is great pressure upon the church from society, it is, easy to be on, it is far easier to be on the narrow path because you're either on, either on the narrow path or you just get off, right? I don't think you can describe the church today as under, being under any real pressure. Right. We, the church, to be clear, has lost uh, some cultural persuasion. There was a time in which the, the church per, was able to influence society far more than it does. That is no longer the case. The fact that we no longer have cultural influence does not mean we're being persecuted, though. We are not a persecuted church. And so we are left with this challenge. If we're going to be disciplined and stay on the narrow path, it's not going to be because culture is pushing us onto it. It's going to be because we're focused on staying on it ourselves. And what that's going to mean is that if there's not a pressure from the sides to stay on it, we have to be looking down the path and be inspired by what's in front of us. To be inspired by the Jesus in whose footsteps we are following. To be inspired by what he describes. I think that's part of why Jesus teaches in such a visual fashion, talking about the mustard seed, that the faith moves mountains, talking about the lost son embraced by the father, the widow who offers her only coins. These are visual things we can hold on to, to be inspired by. That's what we're driving towards. I listened to an author this week by the name of Rory Vaden talk about discipline, about how a lack of discipline is rooted in a lack of vision. If we don't have a vision of where we're going, we don't understand why we would want to work towards it. Right? We've got to have a vision of being a community like Acts describes, where no one in the church has any need. Even the widows are provided for. We need to have this vision of a church that brings in new people who are excited about Jesus. We need to be a church that transforms people's lives, and to see that and to be excited about that and to have that vision in front of us. So that inspires us, and we are drawn towards it. It draws us down the narrow path in front of us. And, and the vision is essential, right? But there's something else you've got to do to stay on the narrow path. And it's a simple thing. You've got to put left foot in front of right, and then left, and then right, and then left, and right. You've got to walk, right? There are things that we do, the daily walk of being a follower of Jesus. To stay on the narrow path involves reading scripture and prayer and going to worship and serving others and practicing forgiveness. Right? If we're going to follow Jesus and stay on the narrow path, we've got to fall in love with the daily grind of following Jesus. And parts of it are going to be a grind, right? Another moment of honesty. Do you love every part of following Jesus? D do you? 
I don't. Right? I'll just flat tell you. I am not a person for whom prayer comes easily. I, I, it's just not. That's not my gig. My perfect week has a long list of to-dos that I can just knock out time after just, just start knocking out those to-dos and get through things. And the idea that I'm going to sit still, be silent, listen, and, and slowly be... I, I start to twitch, right? I, I do not have a deep passion for prayer. And I'm sure that you have, there are parts of following Jesus you don't have a deep passion for. And my word for you this morning is the same word that I have for myself. Tough. Right? Tough. It's the narrow path. It's going to take a little bit of work. If it was easy, how often do you do something easy that's really worth it? You say, that was really worth it. That was really easy. I'm so glad I did the easy thing, right? Falling in love with the daily grind means that there are going to be parts of following Jesus that we're not deeply passionate about. But we do it anyways. Left, right, left, right. If you're going to go down the path, you've got to do those things that make for following Jesus. One last bit about uh, discipline. You've got to have the vision of where you're going. You got to have that that discipline to, to just put left in front of right, in front of left, in front of right, to just get down the path. To know that you're going to read scripture and pray and serve and go to worship and forgive. Uh, you're also not going to get it all figured out tomorrow. Right? How often do you have like a moment, a mountaintop? You ever had a mountaintop moment in your life, and you think I'm going to go back? I'm going to go back home, and tomorrow I'm, 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 going to, I'm never going to miss worship again. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to forgive everyone who's done me wrong, and I'm going to serve people, and, and uh, you're going to just going to turn your life around. You know what happens when you commit to do that? Right? You face plant. You can't turn your life around. Not, it doesn't happen. It takes walking the narrow path. You know how long the narrow path takes to walk? A lifetime. Right? You're going to be at it for a while. And so the discipline is not to try to be perfect tomorrow. The discipline is to look at the whole, all of the pieces of following Jesus and to focus on one. And you get that down. And then you focus on the next. When I start, first started following Jesus, I, I learned, it took me about two years, two and a half years, to learn to read the Bible. To really learn to read the Bible. I would get up every morning and I would read my Bible and I would struggle to pray. And I went to worship when I could. I was in college and I didn't get to worship every Sunday. And I didn't pray much and I didn't know how, I wasn't serving very often. But I was, I was learning to read my Bible. And then the next thing after two years, I, I could read my Bible. And I graduated, and I was going to go off to seminary. And to go to seminary, I had to learn how to have faith, right? I had to learn how to trust. Because, let's just imagine for a minute, Andy, I have a degree in science. I'm going to go to theology. I'm going from a field of hard science, and I'm going to a liberal art. I have no experience in. I'm going to one of the best schools in the world. In my application, I didn't even think I wanted to be a pastor. I wrote my application to Duke and said, basically, I have a good GPA. I like the Bible. Please let me in. Right? There is, I don't know why they let me in. I, I, to this day, am seriously confused on why they let me in. They trained pastors. I said, I like the Bible. Okay. Right? To go to seminary was for me to learn to trust and to have faith that God would get me through things that were completely overwhelming, and they were. Right? And then I got done, I spent three years learning to trust, and I went to the church, and that's when I learned to serve. Right? To talk about serving in seminary is one thing. To get into the local church and have someone call you at 3.43 a.m. because someone is dying... I, I remember that name, that number for a reason, right? But that's when I learned to serve, right? I did not start following Jesus and the next day I'm going to turn my entire life around. No, you start walking the narrow path and you work on one thing at a time. And it might take you a year. It might take you two years. It might take you five years. That's okay. You got a lifetime to work on it. We are a Methodist, right? Methodical. We're going to be at this for a bit. If you want to know why people's lives are not being ever more transformed by following Jesus, this is part of what Jesus' answer is. A lack of faith and a lack of discipline. Learning to trust. Learning to have that faith that God will provide. Walking in the light and believing 
that a good God is active and you will have what you need. Maybe not what you want, but you will have what you need. And that faith combined with a discipline to take the narrow path, to focus on what is next. To do it, to love the daily grind, and to do it even when you don't have a passion about it because it is important, because it is worth it. And so I want to ask you this day, what is the piece of discipline that you need to focus on next? What's the thing you need to spend the next year, two years, three years, really developing in yourself? You got a long, narrow path to walk in front of you. You got a whole lifetime to walk it. What's your next task? Forgiveness? Service? Study? Prayer? What do you need to do next? Amen. I want to leave you with a benediction and a, a bit of hope. I told you I'm not a big fan of prayer. It, it's grown on me. It's not my favorite thing to do, I'll confess, but I get up every morning and I work out and I read and I pray. It's just become part of what I do. I, I can tell you I have learned to love that part of the daily grind. Now I'm working on what's next. And so I send you forth to walk the narrow path to be disciplined, to take one part of following Jesus and work on it until you have mastered it, because it's worth it. Go forth now in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.